Welcome, everyone. It's May, and May traditionally is called Osteoporosis Month here in the United States. We at the Center for Better Bones and Alkaline for Life have renamed May to the Month of Bone Strength, and it's our pleasure to be able to offer this wonderful education community event tonight where we're going to look deeply into bone strength and consider some new possibilities, a brand new technology for measuring bone strength. We're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Andy Bush. He's an orthopedic surgeon from Central, from the North Carolina, and he's founder and director of the Central Carolina Orthopedic Associates. Dr. Bush has been working as an orthopedic surgeon for 25 years with a special interest in bone health and the prevention of osteoporosis. Welcome, Dr. Bush, to our interview. We're happy to have you with us here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I'm happy to be here. Greg, you know, and I've got to take my hat off to you right away because it's very rare that I see orthopedic surgeons stepping out of the operating room and really looking to see how they can help people maximize their health and maximize their bone health and even prevent osteoporosis. So my clients, I've seen thousands of clients who'd like to look for an orthopedic surgeon like that. So I congratulate you. Thanks, Dr. Brown. <laughs> You know, Dr. Bush is one of the foremost physicians in this country who really has looked into the new way of trying to detect bone strength and trying to establish the bone density of clients. And this technology, as, as, as you might have heard, is an Italian technology. It's based on ultrasound and it is called the Echolite REMS technology. Tonight, Dr. Bush is going to explain all about that technology to us, how this works, how it's different from DEXA, how, how, how precise it might be at predicting the likelihood that one will fracture and actually detecting bone strength. You know, here at the Center for Better Bones, I've been doing this a long time. I've been 40 years looking at bone health as both an anthropologist and a nutritionist, and I've seen a lot of changes and I've seen new technologies come, new ideas come, and I've had the opportunity to witness the development of the definition of osteoporosis by DEXA, that's our standard bone density, our, our bone density based on x-ray that we use today, that, that idea of a DEXA T-score defining osteoporosis is really relatively new, and it only occurred over the last 40 years. And one of the things that fascinates me is that now after 40 years of using this DEXA bone density testing, we're finding out that that has many limitations. And those limitations, maybe Dr. Bush will talk about some of those, but those limitations I have found in my practice to be very significant. Things like this testing is, is very vulnerable to placement on the machine. The European research suggests that actually 90% of these tests have certain inaccuracies and maybe 50% very serious inaccuracies that they're not suited particularly for thin and small women, small bone, that they really are not so much measuring bone density, that they're a, but an aerial measurement. And so the size of the bone is very important. The long and the short of it is new studies show that bone density by DEXA is not particularly effective at predicting fracture. And in fact, studies show that anywhere from 80%, let's say from 60% to 80% of all fractures occur in people who have either osteopenia or even normal bone density. So here at the Center for Better Bones, and after all my years of experience, I've come to question the using the DEXA by x-ray as a gold standard for measuring bone strength and for dying, diagnosing osteoporosis. We've been looking for a better way to assess bone strength. And, I, and my interest was really piqued when I saw that the Europeans, the Italians in particular, have developed a new machine, not based on radiation, but based on sound waves on ultrasound to detect bone strength and bone fragility. So I jumped right on and asked Dr. Bush if he'd join us. And I think we're gonna have a really interesting time tonight to see, are we on the frontier of detecting a new way to identify bones, 
weakness and to identify those who might fracture and even a new way to monitor the success of the program. Perhaps a way where we can see the changes within as early as six months. So I'm really excited. I thank you all for joining us and I certainly thank Dr. Bush for being with us. So to kick it off, Dr. Bush, I wanna ask you as a surgeon, how did you get interested in this question of really building bone health and not just do, doing surgery and actually looking into bone strength? Why did this become, how did this become an important issue for you? I, I think a few things came together or in, in happenstance, uh, actually. Um, probably the, the shutdown with the coronavirus had part to do with it. Right. It's prior to that, being a or orthopedic surgeon in, in the, or the only orthopedic surgeon in a couple of counties in central North Carolina, I was very busy. I was busy. Okay and busy f fixing fractures, not really concerning myself more than making sure that the surgeries were done correctly and people would heal. And then I would refer them to somebody, quote unquote, somebody to take care of the bone afterwards as I went right. to my next patient to, to fix who was waiting for me in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, I, I was guilty myself, but a lot of orthopedic surgeons, again, we're, we're busy fixing the problem yeah. once it happens. Right. right. Um, with with the slowdown with with the uh, pandemic, it kind of um, again it's also a little bit of age. I started wondering. Well, wait a minute. There's more to this, and also was beginning to read that uh, folks like yourselves were, were beginning to say, wait a minute, there's a problem here. I mean, this is mm -hmm. a this is a pandemic also of fractures or an epidemic of fractures. So right, right. Um, that got me interested in thinking. Well, maybe while things were were slow because of the pandemic, we could start a program instead of fixing for instead of fixing. Of fixing fractures, trying to prevent them. Right. Um, Good idea. And I, I looked at the DEXA, the cost of DEXA and some of the problems made me back off from it, thinking that, okay, mm -hmm. I would I would deal with patients in one way and get the DEXAs or whatever I could in another way. And it was just by chance that I happened upon an email from a company called Echolite. It caught my attention because it was talking about what's known as periprosthetic fractures, uh, mm -hmm. fractures that, are, that happen around joint implants. And obviously, uh -huh. as a surgeon, I have seen them, I have treated them. They are very devastating injuries. And the surgery mm -hmm. to fix that is, is, is often very taxing on a patient, very mm -hmm. difficult to do uh, technically. Uh -huh. So um, again, it, ha having caught my eye, I started looking into this machine called Echo S that, that used the REMS technology, called the company. They immediately uh, responded, came over, and within, three, within a month or two, we had a machine Within three months, I had a bone health program going based on the REMS. So in a nutshell, that's how I got into this. And, and now you've done hundreds of, of these scans, or how many did you say, 500 of these scans or something? I, I was talking to James, who's my um, clinical director, and, 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 and he and I trained together when we first started, but he continued doing the studies where I started spending more time uh, as, my, as my practice was growing, actually, with talking to patients, interviewing patients. James yeah. is up to about 500 scans. So, yeah, he's, so you quite, have, he's quite proficient. So, so you have a big experience at this and we're really interested in knowing your, what you found about it and the, really the ability of these to predict fracture. But before we get into those, the kind of the, the new studies and, and the science of all this, tell us what this REMS technology is and how it's different from the bone density test that we know by the DEXA bone density test. Obviously, the technology behind it is um, is incredible, and the people were. I mean, I, I I mentioned to patients as they come through that we're lucky to have people that smart to develop DEXA and to develop REMS. I mean, this is fantastic technology. Uh, mm -hmm. To try to simplify it um, and and to show the difference, uh, DEXA basically um, is two X-ray beams that are passed through a patient, and the ability of the bone to block those X-ray beams is what's measured. Okay. Now, the x-ray beams are at different energy levels. So one beam is blocked more than the other. So that difference or differential and the attenuation that the bone does brings about the term attenuation differential, which is the foundation of DEXA. That's what gets measured. That's what gets mathematically processed into the BMD value then into the T-score. So you're measuring how well something blocks the x-ray beams. Right, okay. And that's ingenious. I mean, fantastically ingenious. And it's really complex mathematics involved. However, it's very persnickety. It, it, you have to position the, the, the patient precisely over the beams because they travel in a fixed, in a fixed path. Also, they don't discriminate what blocks them. If, if you had bone spurs, if you have arthritis, if you have I calcified see. arteries, those are gonna block the x-ray beams and DEX is not gonna tell you that. If you throw car keys on somebody, 
those are going to block the, the x-ray beams and DEXA won't tell you that. It depends the, um, on the examiner to say, wait a minute, those are car keys or that's a zipper or that's a bra strap that's in the way we need to remove those and redo the study. And so, the placement, I hear, the placement on the machine is very, very sensitive. Extremely, uh, because you have to think also DEXA passes through your entire spine. The, the okay. back part of the spine is cortical bone. The, 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 the transverse processes, the spinous process, the neural foramen, that's all surrounded by cortical bone. That's not part of what we're examining because that doesn't break. The front of the bone, the, the, um, the vertebral body, the thing that looks like a tuna fish can, that's what gets compressed. But the x-ray beams pass through the whole spine. So you have to have the ability to mathematically remove the bone that you don't want to measure. And, and so you have to be in the right position for those equations to work. And if, you're, if you're rotated, it's going to throw things off. So there's a lot of places where errors can happen just because of how the information is obtained by DEXA. I see. And that's why the studies show that there's a large percentage, some, a large percentage of error in these bone density tests, in the bone density tests by DEXA. Yeah. And, and in these days, with, with medicine these days, with the, with the reimbursement rates and everything else, DEXAs have to be done quickly in order for a facility yeah. to be able to stay open. And sometimes right. quality, sometimes quality gets cut. Sometimes I see. I can understand it. And how about so the echo light? It's a different technology altogether. Yeah, it's it's ultrasound based, so it's not ionizing radiations. It's ultrasound, and it's done from the front. So I, I have somebody just lying on, a, on on the exam table, and to look at their their spine, I basically do the probe over their abdomen, a hand breath above the belly button, a hand breath below. And the sound waves um, are actually, it's pulsed sonography. So a pulsed sound wave goes in and then the echo comes back and the machine listens to it. And, and just like if you yell into a canyon and you hear your echo come back, well, it'll, it'll say what you said, but it will not sound like you because the, the walls of the canyon, the rocks, the trees, yes, they yes, modify yes, okay. the sound wave. And the same thing happens with the bone. A good bone will modify that sound wave different than bad bone. And, and the machine, the Echo S, the uh, REMS technology has the ability to, uh, to um, select the sound waves that are specific for how many crystals you have so you can get a measure of density. And then a second sound wave of how those crystals are put together so you get a measure of, of bone quality. And you had mentioned bone strength. Bone yeah. strength is actually a measure of density and of quality. I see. And so they factor together the density and the, the strength or the architecture in mm -hmm. order to. So, so, so the Ecolite not only does bone density, but it, it has a fragility index. A fragility score. A fragility score. And that's the score that reveals the strength. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the density is, um, and the way that DEXA was set up um, is to report similar, uh, I mean, say the REMS was set up is to report similar to DEXA. So it's an aerial BMD, um, and you get the BMD value, you get the T-score, and basically you can get a diagnosis uh, according to World Health Organization standards. But the other, the other information that's coming back, that echo that was created by how the bone is actually structured, that is converted to the fragility score, which then is, is, is checked against a database of people who are fragile, non-fragile, people who've broken or haven't broken. And, and the quality of the person being examined is, 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 is compared to this database of bone qualities. And they're assigned whether, whether that each segment was fragile or not. And then the proportion of those segments determines, do you have low, medium, or high fracture risk? You know, that's pretty fascinating that, uh, you know, you see this evolution of all these technologies that now this concept that you put a sound wave in and whatever, and what comes back reflects can reflect the, you get a different re echo back from a healthy bone as compared to a bone that is weakened. And of course they did lots of studies to set up these, 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 uh, these parameters, but that's yeah. pretty striking. That's pretty amazing. And how effective do you feel it is at de detecting uh, fragility with bone and, and likelihood of fracture? Well, I think it's very high. I mean, I, I, uh, I've been relatively new at this. I've been doing it two years. We might have you know, 500 studies, uh, 300 plus cases because we've been doing a lot of repeat studies lately. Um, I have not seen a case where somebody uh, who had a fragility score that was low probability come back yet or contact me yet that they have sustained a fracture. But obviously I'm relatively new at this game. And I had mentioned to you, there's another orthopedic surgeon in England, Dr. Nicholas Birch who has been doing REM since, 19, uh, since uh, 20, 2019. And he has about 1,600 uh, REM studies. 
uh -huh. and he and I are now comparing notes. And he also has yet to come across somebody who's come back to him and say, wait a minute, my fragility score indicated I was low probability, but I have sustained a fracture. And not that that yeah. can happen. I mean, nothing's 100 percent, but I have not come across that yet. And either that's so yeah, exactly nothing is 100 percent. But it seems to me in my research that it seems like this has a possibility of being much more effective at predicting fracture than the current DEXA situation is. In fact, I noticed there's a recent piece of research by these um, by the Europeans who are working with this. Um, per, where they look at, at about 1,400 people and they actually compare over five years the DEXA, what the DEXA suggests the fracture rate will be, and the actual fracture incidence as, as predicted by REMS, then looking at which one was more effective. And as I read the study, REMS was more effective at predicting the likelihood of fracture, predicting detecting bone strength, in other words. Yeah, that's Did correct. Um, it's the, the, this recent paper, it just actually was published in January. Um, it, it, it confirmed, it actually has an established original paper was to, from 2017, but right. several more studies have been done. And this one basically confirmed that the fragility score was more the most sensitive in determining who was going to fracture and the most specific in determining who was not as compared to BMD values from either REMS or DEXA. Right, so the fragility score was the most effective score at predicting fracture likelihood, even even certainly much better than the DEXA and even better than the DEXA by REM itself. This is to us is striking because we are looking for some way to measure bone strength. We know that we've, we've long said, well, we, in the early days, they said, well, the Oriental woman, they fracture a lot more because they, they're so small and small bones. But then when they finally did the research, they found out they fractured less than the average, than the Anglo population. So we know there's much more to bone strength that we haven't detected. And this is, to us, this is very fascinating. And yes, this new research I have here, it was published in, in 2023, and it's the fragility score analysis. If any of you are interested, we can get you the reference or the, or Dr. Bush's group can get you the reference, but there's some interesting science coming up on this. And like you say, in your own practice, you've seen it, you, you haven't, you, you've seen it be very effective at, at distinguishing the people with low, with weak with fragility should let's just show what this uh, what this uh report looks like let me have a let's let, we're going to put up a a little vis visual of what this re of the what the echo light report looks like now the as we'll mention that the echo light is done on both the spine and the hip which is really helpful because hip fractures are of course the the real very expensive fractures and often threatening fractures and that this 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 ultrasound technology can measure both the spine and the hip. And this is a um, this is uh, let's see what we've got here now. Um, this is not the let's get let's get the first page. Okay, we'll go up yeah, to the. If you could scroll down. It's on the first page. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, just got to get used to using this little scroll thing here. Let me see. Listen, maybe maybe I got it now. So this is the spine here, you'll see. And this is from the Central Carolina Orthopedics where Dr. Bush is at. And you'll see here that the first thing you notice, this is the REMS of the spine. And you'll notice on this scale, this is the T-score, just like you, just like the DEXA, right, uh, Dr. Bush? This is That's sort of what you see. And, and the red indicates when it's in the, a lower bone density score with the osteoporotic score, right? That's correct, yes. And the yellow is osteopenia and the green yeah. is uh, is the normal bone. And you can see over on the side, another image of these spines. This is what it's reconstructed the, when the echo waves come back. And then the interesting thing is that the, the they it also measures the four lumbar vertebral bodies and it gives you a T-score for each one. And it also looks at the total, the Z-score, People probably remember that the T-score compares you to people your own age, to young people like a 30-year-old. The Z-score compares you to people your own age, and it gives you the diagnosis by the World Health Organization. And I would mention that this World Health Organization definition of osteoporosis by T-score is, is a new invention. It's only 40 years old, and it's... And it's questionable to me because we see so many people fracture that do not technically have osteoporosis. 
Um, but anyway, then we get to the most important part, which is a fracture risk assessment and this fragility score. Dr. Bush, can, can you explain to us, in this report says the fragility score of the spine is 23.5 over 100. So what does this exactly mean? So um, it actually, the way they're presenting it, um, it, it looks like it's a percent. It looks like it's 23.5%. 20, and in actuality of what it's reporting, that is correct. But when you, when you say I, I have a fragility score, you don't say percent. You don't say my fragility score was 23.5%. Right. It's 23.5 okay. period. Okay. Um, now, the, the way that this was determined, the 23.5, um, and actually it probably would be better if you went to the second page, because I think that that graph would, would, is, is going to be a good representation of, okay. of what's going on here. So, so this is the graphic representation of the fragility score. Um, okay. The first graph that we looked at, uh, like Dr. Brown was saying, was the T-scores. And it was just a, a quick visual of where you are, whether you're in the, in the red um, uh, on the bottom or if you're in the green on the top, you're normal. This is a different, this is a different, uh, uh, this is different information. This is a mm -hmm. database of people who were really just um, stratified on whether they broke or they didn't, whether they're fragile or non-fragile. So the red swath is the individuals who have sustained fractures. The green swath are individuals who have not. You see so, the red, the red swath is what now? Did you say the individuals who have sustained fractures, the ones who are fragile, who 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 they who 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 have fra who have assessed who have fractured. So with, so the numbers that are in that red zone of uh, uh, if you're at, at at the age of twenties from about fifty whatever that would be fifty five up to a hundred, all of those folks with those numbers in that red swath would be for people who sustain fractures. Oh, I see. I see. So it's actually indicating that red group is people of that age that have that have fractured. If they have a fragility score, of score. Up. That, that puts them in that in that red area, then they have then they they either what I tell my patients if if they're in, if their score unfortunately is up there, if they haven't fractured, I tell them that they're in borrowed time. And oh, and in I my see. practice, you had asked you had actually mentioned a little bit. Um, I have done some rams on people that I have fixed their hip fractures. They are all in the red. I have not yeah. had a single individual who, where they've had an, an ORIF of a hip fracture not be in the red. So that's and have you, now, it's anecdotal, but it's consistent. And have you some, seen some people in the red that didn't fracture? Of course, you, yes. you, haven't had, you haven't had years and years to look at that. But if you saw someone in the red, you tend to think this is probably a great probability if you haven't fractured yeah. that you're at quite high risk. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the way the numbers are derived. So that number is, I think it's 23 point something. So uh -huh. what that number indicates, and it's 23 something out of 100, so it's 23 segments out of 100 segments that are analyzed. And obviously a lot more segment, segments get analyzed, but it's 23 out of a grouping of 100 that have the same echo that, that the, the, individual, the individual's bone, 23 of their segments have an echo that matches the echo of somebody who has broken, who is fragile. But um, 77, slices match somebody who has not. So in this individual, you can see the target is actually in the green, which indicates that at that age of about 55 or 53, at a fragility score of 23, there is nobody at that age with that fragility score in this database who has sustained a fracture. Wow, that's, that's pretty audacious because there's so many causes for fracture. Um, and sometimes we see people like with diabetes that seem to have a stronger bone density by DEXA, yet they fracture more. And so has this been worked like with diabetic patients? Has it been studied with? I'm gonna say uh, there's, there are studies out there and I, I, I don't have access to them right now, but there are studies where REMS has looked at diabetics um, and the BMD is artificially high in folks with diabetes. Nobody's really sure why. It could yeah. be the microcalcification, it could be the calcification of the microvasculature. There, there's a process called hyperostosis, that uh, idiopathic hyperostosis that happens with diabetics. So the BMD could look really good. Anecdotally, on my, on my patients who are diabetic and I've done a fragility score, they've been in the yellow. Yeah. Everything yeah. else, you know, they might be in the green on, on the BMD, even with REMS, but on the fragility score, they're in the yellow. So that reminds us that the fragility score is probably the most important parameter to look at if you're trying to predict fracture and assess bone strength. 
I, I agree. And that for me in my practice, that is because that's actually, so, so fragility score is a, is a measure of bone quality, but it's, but it's compared immediately to fracture risk. So this is a yeah. graph of looking at fracture risk. So your fragility score is 23, but it's, but, the, but it's being represented in relationship to people who have broken and haven't broken. So you're immediately seeing what is, what is, what is your probability? Again, you, and this patient, uh, this, this patient was osteoporotic. And she's a pretty small lady. I think that if you looked at the original numbers, she's she's not um, BMI is low um, uh, height. She's she's pretty short. So small bone. So she's osteoporotic based on the databases and stuff that are used even by RAMS. But in a fragility um, uh, assessment, which is independent of all that, her bone structure is very good. So this is this is a patient who I did not recommend medication for, even though she's osteoporotic. Yes, that's very exciting. That that there's a possibility to detect bone strength in a non-invasive, without radiation, a very safe way that, that and it appears, I've read some research suggesting that you can monitor the treatment. Say if we took someone um, in, in whatever stage of bone fragility and put them on our, our natural better bone solution program, that we could see the progress of that program in as short as six months, a year. How does, how, how does that work out? Um, How sensitive the, is it? The, the, the numbers that are put out by Echolite um, are the um, reproducibility, the, the least significant change, which is, a, which is an error measure for DEXA and for REMS. Right. For REMS, the least significant changes in the, in the studies that are quoted are 0.5 to 1.05%. So let's say one, it's about 1%. The, the studies that for DEXA are 3 to 5%. Yes, yes, or, or more at times. That's for that's so. So, could you expect to see change in six months or eight months? Or the studies that that the Echolite has put out itself, that the company has put out from Italy, um, uh, watching folks on medications like the Nosumab, they mm -hmm. say in six months they're able to to detect whether the medicine is working or not. Yes, we we're we're really lo looking forward to that. We have several clients that have have received the Echolite test and then we're starting them on our, before they started our program or just when they started to see how quickly they can notice strength changes. It's, um, it's interesting for the audience to know there's only a few, a few of these devices in the United States so far, probably five or six. In fact, our office has a list of all the people, but Dr. Bush is in uh, North Carolina there and, and, uh, and Dr. Bush is actually going to be coming to our Better Bones solution workshop in Kerpalo, uh, May 18th to the 21st. He, he is able to see a few people. I think there's a few slots left. If anyone's interested, you can contact Dr. Bush, Bush's office. If you happen to can be around in Western Massachusetts or better yet come to the Better Bone Solution four-day workshop at this lovely meditation retreat center. Looks to me like we're very interested in monitoring the, pro the progress of our program People feel better. They say, I feel stronger. We know that if you build muscle, you're going to build bone. Um, can the echo light, it, it, can it test muscle mass too, or not quite there yet? It's not quite there yet. I know that the um, uh, that is an algorithm that's being developed, but I don't know how far along uh, echo light is with that, but that is uh, one of their goals. You know, I think that's one of the most important things that could be done is to call attention to the fact that we lose bone together, we lose bone and muscle together, that there's really one single bone muscle unit. And to put attention on maintaining muscle mass, which is one of the most important ways to maintain youthfulness and to extend longevity, one of the most successful techniques, not only to prevent osteoporosis, but to maintain health as we age. We, I'd like to see people think more about putting bone health together with muscle health and pay more attention to building muscle strength than worrying so much about osteoporosis doing a strong nutrition program, a strong supplement program, but realizing that the exercise is such an important component. It'll be great when the Echolite can measure muscle and muscle loss right along with bone fragility and bone loss. Now, I mean, Dr. Brown, I, I, I want to you know, I, I, I commend you on that, on that statement. Um, the research that's coming out now is basically that's the direction things are headed in. And, oh, and, yeah. And and the articles that I've been reading, and actually what, what I believe is if you have a, ho a horse in the cart model, the horse is muscle loss, the cart is osteoporosis. If, if you don't have muscle strength, if your bones aren't feeling a force, they're gonna go away. It, yeah, you have to have the muscle, like I said, the muscle bone unit, it's a single unit. 
And that yeah. muscle has to be there. And again, if it's not there, the bone's going to respond by also going away. You know, and it's as an anthropologist, it makes so much good sense. Nature is not going to waste energy building something that we're never going to use. And you have to constantly show that you're because we think we have infinite energy and infinite resources, but we don't. The body is also always calculating what should I do? I have to maintain pH or I die real quickly, but I really don't have to maintain bone because bone is going to last a lot longer than this physical body. And so it's always figuring where to spend the energy. And certainly if you show the body, you need to have strong muscles, you will develop strong bones. And that's such an, it would be wonderful to move the shift from this fear of osteoporosis and this fear of bone density test. One of the big problems with DEXA is that so many of our clients come back practically paralyzed with fear. And sometimes they're told outrageous things like your bone density is so low, you're going to fracture in a short while. I've heard people, you're going to be in wheelchairs. You're going to, you're going to end up in a nursing home in two years. And really it's often unfounded and certainly no. So it's, we really need a good measurement of bone strength. And we also need to change our approach to building lifelong bone strength to be much more comprehensive and that's why we've taken on, that's why I spent decades developing every step of the Better Bone Solution, which is everything from an alkaline diet to, of course, the exercise to proper supplementation. Every nutrient plays a role in bone health. And I'm sure you know, when you see people heal, some people heal quickly from your surgery. Some people take a long time to heal. And it all reflects the status of the resilience of the body. So yeah, I think we're in a new frontier in bone health. And I think that there's a big chance the Echolite can play a really important role in that. And I certainly hope we get to, I hope lots of my clients and all of you listening take the opportunity to find where you can get an Echolite test, get it done. Let's see how you progress on your natural program or if you decide to do a drug program to see how you progress in the actual treatment. Dr. Bush, are there some people that, are more would benefit more from the echo light than others or, or some people that shouldn't use it any any thoughts about that um i i think that people who benefit from it are as we had mentioned some groups like folks with diabetes i think you're going to get a better better measure of the bone health on somebody for who's diabetic um, right. uh, obviously the bone health during pregnancy you're you're not going to use dexa and oh, there is yeah. There's something known as osteoporosis-related uh, pregnancy or lactation-related osteoporosis. Right. Um, so, there, I mean, obviously there are groups of people, younger people. Uh, DEXA is low energy. I mean, one thing about it, it's not a, like a regular x-ray. It is much lower energy. The problem, and I've only seen this in a couple of times, a couple of the articles that I've read where somebody has brought attention to this, is it's not the necessarily the dose you get today. It's the dose of x-rays you're getting over your lifetime. Right, right. That's the problem. And it's the example would be, would be uh, skin cancer or melanoma. If you get a melanoma this year, it's not because you got a sunburn last year. It's because you got a yeah. sunburn when you were 20 years old. So that's the problem with, with getting uh, serial DEXs done. You are getting a cumulative effect of the radiation, the effects of the radiation on your DNA over a period of time. So yeah, definitely so if you want to do younger screenings, you, want to, you, don't, you don't want to be using the radiation. Yes, exactly. I think it's, it's really important that everyone limit their radiation exposure. In fact, so much medical radiation, certainly with CAT scans, there's such a high exposure. Yeah. And in fact, I, I reported on work of Canadian radiologists who developed a protocol of antioxidants to take five days before a CAT scan to try to protect from some of that DNA damage. And we're starting to appreciate the problems with our total load of radiation from medical devices and certainly the need to boost up our, our antioxidants in order to deal with all this. And the less radiation, the better. That's certainly a very favorable thing. The most important thing that we're struck with, though, is the ability to measure bone strength. So this test will work probably better for the small, thin women. My audience is, is very largely women who are small boned, lightweight. They, it's my impression that they're going to get a better shake on an assessment of their bone strength with this test rather than with the DEXA. Do you think that's accurate? Yes. Uh, and again, because of the, the problems with DEXA and measuring and, and, mis, and, and not measuring bone correctly, the, the uh, small bone correctly, and also just uh -huh. giving the BMD value. Now, um, REMS is not affected by bone size. 
However, right, yes. the, the reporting of, of the BMD values, they do use normative databases, which are average size people. So again, somebody with small bones will be, will be biased against even by RAMS as far as reporting BMD. Now the fragility score is not biased at all. Fragility score is it's looking at your structure and comparing your structure to this database. And it, did this person break or didn't they break, regardless of their size? You know, it's interesting because I've seen some small women, two or three or four of my clients have been able to get DEXAs and compare them uh, with, a, with the bone, with the, with the, get DEXAs and compare them with the REMS. And like this one person was like a minus 5.4 T score by DEXA and a 2.1 on REMS. I mean, that's a dramatic difference. Yeah. And again, it was a thin person. Usually it's, it's, it's notable the difference in the REMS and the DEXA T score, but not that noticeable. But most important to us is that fragility index. And it's interesting how the new article you mentioned really points up that the fragility index is one of the most, is the most accurate way that we can find today to measure likelihood of fracture. So that's really, that's an outstanding thing. That really is. And this will work for children as well. Yes, the, um, the uh, Echolight does not have an algorithm for anyone younger than 20, and that was a result of the pandemic where they were unable to do to build a dat databases. So I know that they're in the process of doing that to try to get a, a younger database. So that's the only limitation. It goes down to 20 right now. Yeah, I mean, it's we. I imagine there's a lot of artificial intelligence going on to try to put all these variables together or, or you know, supreme mechanical intelligence, but I look forward to that day. And I look forward to the day when they also talk about muscle strength, because that will be a new era when people do not so much focus. We've over-focused on bone. We've, and we've invented this osteopenia, which is also, I mean, it, it really troubles me when people come in and say, I have osteopenia. You don't, osteopenia is not anything. It's a made up, it's a made up number that they developed uh, 10 years after they developed the bone density scores. They took the people who had the lowest bone densities by DEX and said, they're gonna, we're going to call them osteoporotic. People with a little better bone density, said, but not normal, we're going to call osteopenia. And then we've got the normal set. And, and many, it was never meant to be a diagnosis. It was never meant to be a clinical disorder. And yet so many women now are running around saying, I have osteopenia, like it's really something to have. Where if we could say, I have fragile bones, that to me is really important. Or I don't have, I'm a thin person, I'm a small person, but I do not have fragile bones, or I need to work on my bone strength, which will take us back to working on muscle strength, working on all these issues of all these nutrients. The alkaline diet is a very important way to maintain bone strength. So yeah, we're excited about this. I think it's, I think it's gonna offer a great, a great, a great opportunity in the future. Hey, Dr. It's, Bush, it's you... going to be good research also, Dr. Brown. I mean, with everything you're talking about, I mean, it's a new frontier. Fragility score is a relatively new measure, and it hasn't been compared to, to nutritional studies, or it hasn't been compared to a lot of the things that are out there to, that we're trying to do to make ourselves healthier. So I, again, I, I'm collecting data. Uh, Do, Dr. Birch in England's collecting data, because at some point we're going to go back and look at it, and then that's going to be the beginnings of studies is to, to monitor folks okay, we have this exercise program. Is there's a specific exercise type that we want to see? Does it really, is it really helping? Are, yes, are exactly. supplements helping? Or, you know, this or, combination of everything, how does that affect the fragility? Or the alkaline, or the alkaline diet, because yeah. it's very clear from the research that if you alkalize the chemistry, you reduce the acid load, the acid load is depleting bone. That would be really fantastic if people did nothing else, but they remineralized and reduce, you can distinguish different subsets, certainly. And you know, another fun subset would be fear. We actually see that worry is very related to bone loss and Karsensky's new study at Columbia University showing that bone is the first part of the body that responds to fear. Even for the, before the adrenals get into action, bone sacrifices its osteocalcin to put into general circulation to quiet down the parasympathetic nervous system so you can be full flight in, full gear in fight or flight for a long period of time. It's like a survival mechanism. And wouldn't it be fun to see if people, if they can, if they can reduce that stress response, that, that, that alone is enough to build bone, to build bone strength, to build bone strength. It's a fascinating new frontier. And I congratulate you for stepping out there. And, and, you know, I always say there's never a crowd on the leading edge and you're out there on the leading edge, trying to bring a new technology uh, 
And I certainly congratulate you and I hope everyone will take the opportunity to try to sooner or later. Do you think um, there'll be more there'll be more testing centers around the country? What, what do you think is going to happen in the near future? Yeah, it, it, it'll help. It'll happen, uh, Dr. Brown. Um, one thing we are um, ourselves developing um, a mobile um, um, uh, uh, project so uh -huh. that we will bring RAMs to different places. And um, I, I'm going to put a plug in for for a, a company. Of, there are two ladies in Canada um, who uh, it's it's um, Osteosound, and they have a mobile program going where they go to different places in Canada with the RAMs. Now, Megan is a is a sonographer. Um, so she, she's not a physician, but I've been helping them out where if they've had clients who need to have yeah. interpretations, I've been helping them out with that. But, but they're doing a great, wonderful job in developing this mobile, this, mobile, uh, unit this mobile practice up in Canada, which we want to copy here in the United States. So that will be happening in the next year to two, two years. But I think you know, the, the community will also see this. Yeah, that's such a great idea because we're part of this whole new age where individuals are starting to realize that we each have to take charge of our health, that no one else is going to care about our health or no one else has the capacity to affect our own health as much as we do. And taking charge of our bone health is a great way, is a great pathway to take care of all of your health. So this would be fun. So I can see the day when we might give the Better Bone Solution course, get a number of people working on this. You bring your gear in, we retest people. Then the next year, the next seven, eight months, whatever, retest again to see how we're coming along. I think the future is looks very bright for this and and all of you listening I hope that you you know keep your eyes open you might have a chance to get tested you can certainly take our better bone solution course begin building bone and then build on it the this new way of assessing bone fragility as you go along but one day they're going to be tied together these these structures these classes we're going to be able to verify quite quickly the progress that's happening I think that's very exciting. I think that's very exciting. Yeah. No, I think really uh, to have a, have a program like yours where you're focusing on on the health of a bone, on on, on keeping people healthy, and then you have a method to to determine what hey, how how well is this working? It's both. I mean, it's necessary for for academic reasons, but it's also to keep people motivated to say, hey, yeah, this is working. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I am seeing the difference. I'm able to actually have a number that tells me what I'm doing is is keeping me healthy so that really it is a hand in glove kind of relationship yes 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 certainly is amazing well we i see we have a lot of questions here so um is there any before we get into the questions dr bush is there any of uh, any others anything we've missed anything you thought would be good to add for the for the uh, for the people that are watching this people that are really concerned about their bone health um any any final thoughts? Anything we've missed here? Um, no, I think that the emphasis on on muscle strength is really something that's also going to be developing, and uh, uh, to in order to have the, the ability to, for bones to feel something, you need a muscle. In order to build back your bone and muscle after you exercise, you need nutrition. So really, it, it's it's not just one issue. It's not just have, having osteoporosis and getting a pill because you're you're osteoporotic. I mean, it's a whole whole program to build your bone and then also having an accurate and reproducible way to say, yes, what I'm doing is working. I mean, that's, I think that's the, your, your program is basically in a nutshell. Yes. And you, and you also have really emphasized the fact that we need to actually work up every case. I mean, I see so many people that are just told to take a drug and no one has studied if they're losing calcium in the urine, if they have a parathyroid problem, if they have high cortisol. I mean, it's like, it's very important to do that workup. And that's actually the first step of the better bone solution is to do a good workup find out what's really happening. And wouldn't it be great if we could add to the workup a fragility score? That, that's, that's the new frontier. I'm, and I, I so appreciate you taking time to be with us. Uh, if you have a few more minutes, could we answer a few questions from some of the yeah. clients here? Yes. Okay, now let's see. Uh, so the first one is, uh, how often should we do the Echolite test? If one did have access to it, how long, how, what, at what intervals do you like to follow up? I usually say yearly, and and there's no, um, I don't have a um, a model to base that on other than just general preventative health. Uh, a mammography is done every year. You know, colonoscopies aren't done every year because of they're they're pretty invasive, and and it's I guess the studies show five years is okay. But basically, right. you're looking at a preventative um, test, and um, 
you know, after a couple of years, you might say, well, I'm fine. You know, I've done, I've done REMS one, two or three years and, and my, my results really aren't changing. The only problem is if, what if something does change in your body? What if there's a hormonal imbalance or something, something starts that all of a sudden the, the bones respond by breaking down and you skip a year or two. And, right. and that's not unheard of. So, so my recommendations usually are yearly and w- along with, with bone markers, vitamin D level, um, so forth, just to really do it like a, like a normal, like you're checking diabetes right, right. or like you're checking blood pressure. It, it's, it's kind of that yearly screen. Um, I'll do it more frequently in somebody who, um, with well, the examples we talked about, there are some of my, my patients who have been in the red, who came in and their fragility scores are either high yellow or in the red indicating they're at high risk. Mm-hmm. They don't want to go on meds. And, and right. basically uh, as a physician, I have to recommend it. But, but if, if plan A doesn't work, I go to, we go to plan B. And plan okay. B is, is, like you said, first making sure the workup is complete, that we know if there's, make sure there's no other problem and then make sure nu- nutrition, exercise, everything's emphasized. And then we, we do monitor it, monitor it every six months just to see, right. are you trending up? Are you trending down? Are you trending a pl- parallel? So that's how I've kind of um, decided whether a year or six months I see. Yeah, that's. It's, I think it's a wonderful monitoring tool. It has great potential as a monitoring tool. I, I think that's one of the most amazing things that you could see in the kind of short term. It's pretty with with standard DEXA. The average person, the average woman, let's say sixty, is losing one half to one percent a year. And if you can get someone just to stabilize, because the natural tendency is to lose as we go along, just like we lose muscle, we lose bone. So. Do you find, I, I mean, when we do these follow-ups, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I'd be happy with stability probably. Do you feel that way? Or do you see people without taking drugs actually boosting their fragility index? Um, I have, I, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm still early, early in doing this project. So, but I have started getting follow-ups and I'm actually beginning to see trends. So yeah. um, it's very rewarding when you see somebody who has been trending downward and you find that you, you figure out, okay, maybe calcium intake isn't dietary calcium in, in, intake isn't good. Something else, activity level wasn't that good. You, the, the, the changes are made and then the follow-up REMS has, has leveled off. You know, the fragility yeah, yeah, score yeah. is not getting worse. Um, yeah, we- it, it, that, it, I have seen that anecdotally. I mean, unfortunately there are some folks who are coming back and as you're saying, they're, they're getting worse as they're getting older. In one year, yeah. there is there is a change. There's a trend towards the fragility score getting worse. And the trick, yeah, you you, you want to maintain that bone strong, even though it may not have as much density. And this might be a <laughs> test that can help you distinguish. Everyone is going to lose density as they age, practically everyone. But but to keep the bone strength, so that you can fully function, that's I think that's a great frontier, and we certainly look forward to using it more. Let me see what else. How long does it take to get the results of the Echolite? test the REMS results? Uh, you get it the same day. Um, as you're lying there getting a test done, you can watch it. And then you, it takes about two minutes for the computer to go through process it to make sure enough there's enough information and the report will appear on the screen. So, so Hannah or That's James great. in my office will show it to, to, our, to our patients and say, okay, this is where you are. Usually I've spoken to the patient beforehand. So they kind of, I've shown them a sample report. So they kind of have an idea. They can either get a printed copy in hand or a electronic copy sent to them or both. And so they'll have it the same day. And then we set up a follow-up appointment to go over the REMS and also just to round everything up in bone health, uh, answer questions about other things and apply the REMS findings to other uh, to, the, to all the aspects of bone health. Right, right, right. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, it says, one question is, can Echolite measure bone improvements from impact and load-bearing exercises? Have any studies been done on this? So I guess they're asking if there's studies on exercise increases in, in, in bone strength. Uh, there, are, there are no papers out on that yet. And I, that's going to be, I mean, if, I'm sure people are working on it. I have an intention to, to work on that also. So, right. but right now, no, there are, there, there is nothing out there. Fragility, uh, the fragility score is still a relatively new um, concept. Uh, so uh, again, there's going to be a lot of research coming out, I think in the next five to 10 years. You know, if this, if the fragility score turned out to be as accurate as these early studies suggest, I, I imagine we will 
end up with a new definition of osteoporosis and not so much by T scores, but by actually true bone strength, which is in the old days, how they measured it. I mean, it was, you only knew you had osteoporosis because your body, your bones failed to in the normal, to carry about normal, the weight of normal activities, the stress and strains of everyday life. It would be great if we, if we moved away from this, to my mind, it would be great if we moved away from this T score to actually a measurement of bone strength. Um, that then uh, that treated everyone equally, you know, and, and some people weren't uh, more set on a fearful path thinking they were going to have problems. <laughs> then this question is, uh, um, oh, this is what, what measurement or detail is considered that would it be considered that one has osteoporosis? And you mentioned there's two ways they're dealing with this, both by with Ecolite talks about bone density and fragility. They want to know when do they say, okay, you have osteoporosis. Well, osteoporosis is the, is the definition as we were we discussing. It's a T score of negative 2.5 or lower. So, right. so that is, that that's determined when the, the uh, echo that comes back that was created by the number of bone crystals. And, and right. then the, the REMS unit converts that to a BMD value that's then converted to a T-score. So you get the diagnosis, the same sort of diagnosis that you would with DEXA of osteoporosis. But the, the difference again is that fragility score, which is completely independent. It's a separate sound wave. And then that gives you the, 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 the microarchitecture, how the structure of the bone is I see, so associated with fracture risk. And the current definition of osteoporosis was defined by the World Health Organization in 1994, where 10 doctors got together and they looked at these bone density reports and they decided, okay, if you're in the lower end, you're going to be called. So still today with REMS, you would be told you had osteoporosis by the T-score, by the, by the ultrasound T-score. Even though your fragility score might have said you don't have high fragility, you still might be told you have a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Yeah. And I, yes. I, I, let me give you, I, I, I think we spoke about this anecdotally. My, I'm going to throw my wife in because I, I tell my patients about her. She's, she's a small yep. lady. She's a hundred pounds. She's five foot tall, hundred pounds, 105 yep. pounds, has been healthy all through her life. A nutritionist, some background, me medical anthropologist also, and a, and a doc yep. now. Um, she is osteoporotic. She's negative three, two, negative three, five on REMS. Yeah. Yeah. Her, her fragility score, she's in the green. So uh, there's no indication for medicine. Now I'm so on, uh, I'm, 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 I'm putting my neck out. I'm, you know, if, if I'm wrong, but I, I yeah, told my yeah, wife, yeah. she doesn't need any medications. But, you know, I think in the future, if this works out, we will not, that we will redefine, what people have to understand is that definition of osteoporosis is new. They invented it 30 years ago based on the DEXA. And if this is true, that there's a way you can measure bone fragility that should very likely replace the definition of osteoporosis because by definition, it's bone weak that has a micro, micro architectural weakness that it can't stand up to everyday loads and the susceptibility to fracture. And if, so I think this is all something in progress. We redefined osteoporosis 30 years ago. Now we find that that definition isn't working great because most fractures occur in people who don't have a diagnosis of osteoporosis by T-score. So if we can come up with a real way to measure true bone strength, to me, that would be a good candidate for replacing the definition, the diagnosis of osteoporosis and the definition of osteoporosis. And so Dr. Brown, gets... I was going to say, we also didn't go into this. I don't want to, this, it's a, it could be a whole new topic, but TBS in, in DEXA, the trabecular bone score, a lot of the DEXA people are also beginning to say, wait a minute, we're gonna, we, we wanna know the TBS score because as you've been emphasizing, the BMD is not, is not determinant. It's only associated right. with fracture risk. Whereas TBS is giving more of the equivalent of what the fragility score gives. It's giving a quality measure of bone using the DEXA information. So even the DEXA folks are beginning to, to swing over to, to say and there's something be, else needed. Been and won't it be fun to see how the trabecular score compares with the fragility score? Yeah. Because so far, I'm not convinced the trabecular score is that is that sound of a measurement. So, and it's very hard to get. It's hard to. So let's. That, this will be so much fun, everyone. If you like the curiosity of seeing how science evolves, this is a this is whole a machine in motion, and we'll have to see how it works out with trabecular score as compared to fragility score, and how trabecular score really shakes out. Certainly in Europe. Uh, some of the really progressive dentists actually measure the premolar that they take an x-ray of the premolar and they can look at those trabecular bodies and it's quite good at predicting, pre 
projecting the strength of the spine. So it's, it makes sense if you can really look at the trabecular bodies. Um, this is way too much fun. Whoever thought talking about bone would be so much fun. So let's just look here, get a couple more fun questions. Um, if anyone is joining, maybe you could ask what sort of follow-up studies they will be doing on REM scans. I had one in August, 2022, which said my spine was minus one, far better than the DEXA with moderate low risk of fracture in the green. Since then, I have had two spinal vertebral fractures. Well, you know, this is really interesting because uh, I don't know, this is, a, one person wrote to it about this, a European person. And I wrote back and I said, you know, let us know the details so I can share it with Dr. Bush too, because if a person says my score came up in the green, but my bone density was low and I had fractures. What would you say about that, Dr. Bush? What, what, we don't know the details of this situation. And I certainly, if, you, yeah, if you'd like I, to write. I would like the details. Yes, yeah, somebody had, had written at one point, I had mentioned to you that someone had posted that, that their, their T-scores were better with, with RAMs and they ended up fracturing. Well, they didn't give me any more information. I really did ask them not to do it publicly, but maybe to get to me privately or just post numbers and I would be happy to answer it then. I never got any information back. I never got what the, what the fragility score was. I never got anything else. I just encouraged that patient, if they weren't going to follow up with me, to follow up with their doctor to make sure that they got checked out. Why did they break their back? Why you know, do they have a full workup? So that's very important. But really, I, I have a hard time answering that question or make, even making a comment because I really need to know the numbers. Yes, exactly. And, you need to know the whole yeah. history. Exactly. And, yeah. and uh, yes, so if you, whoever wrote that comment, we'd love to hear some of the details and we'd love to look in that more carefully. You certainly need a complete workup to see what intervening variable could have been related to that fracture. Explain why DEXA can be misleading for someone like me who is 5'1". I think we've talked a lot about that, the fact that the bone densities are not are not a true. Uh, they're an aerial measurement. Bone size it very impacts the results, and so a small person gets that result. Does health insurance cover the REMS testing? What have you found about that, uh, Doctor? Uh, it, it does not. Um, we we do it as on a cash basis in the office. So the REMS we ask patients to pay out out of pocket. We try to keep the uh, price low because we are in a in a poor rural area of North Carolina. So we're, we're trying to service our community also. Um, I, I do do uh, normal office visits. So when someone comes, it's a, it's a real medical evaluation. So we, we, do, right. we do file that through insurance and that, that's not a problem, but the REMS itself is not covered by um, insurance. And I think that's just a matter of time. I mean, those, that machinery works very slowly, but certainly if uh, this, uh, Eventually, I suspect if this proves out to be as effective as it appears, it will be tested. Um, this is somebody who, uh, how long should I expect the technicians in the Calgary place, uh, which is classic. Uh, oh, she wanted to know how, how long will it be, be before in Calgary, the technicians are trained in REMS. I mean, that God knows, you know, when yeah. they're going to pick it up. But, you, you know, whoever wrote that comment, you might go back and talk to the people. You might you might look up some of the research on REMS. Um, Dr. Bush has a website where he has some ways, some tips for talking to your doctors about the treatment, about REMS, about looking into REMS. So, yeah, we can all become advocates for, for, for new progressive treatments for osteoporosis and progressive ways to diagnose osteoporosis. When Dr. Bush says, it measures the spine. Does that mean each vertebral body? Is the echolate more accurate for small? Okay, so again, it's just the four lumbar bodies that yes. are- L1 through L4. L1, the same as with the DEXA, yeah. Yes, the same, the, same, the same bones. If you're in the red, what is the course of action, uh, medicine or something else? That's it, she goes on to say, my spine is minus 5.4 on DEXA, but with the REM test, it was minus 2.1. How can we be sure that the REM is correct? Uh, hips are about the same. So we don't know actually what her fragility score was. So if you're in the red, what is the course of action? I guess we'll stick with that question. We're going well, to presume um, the red for fragility. I, I, think, I think also the base question is how do you know which test is accurate? 
So, okay. so obviously, there has to be a level of trust that this um, that any machine that's being produced and put on as a um, medical device meets basic standards. So, so yes. I'm just yeah, that has to be an assumption. And it, it, it's uh, both DEX and REMS are FDA approved. They've gone through the processes. Um, REMS is not as demanding as far as calibration, so forth, because it's ultrasound. Whereas DEXA is a radiation, uh, is, a, is a cathode ray tube, is a light bulb, basically, that, that can burn out with time. So there's going to be a, a decrease in the energy based on the, the age of the, of the unit or the age of the, of the tube. So there are different uh, things that have to be calibrated to make sure that the machine is producing what you, would, you assume it's producing. Now, when you look at a report, you want the numbers to, to, to come together. You don't want the numbers to be all over the place. Right. So, so for, for, I think that's the simplest way that, what, and, I, and I, I use this phrase a lot, it needs to make sense. And a lot of times with REMS, yeah, the REMS numbers will be smaller than the DEXA, but they'll be all together. So you'll have a spine that's negative two, five, a hip that's negative two, three, another hip that's negative two, two. Whereas DEXA, you'll have a spine that's negative three, five, and then a hip that's negative two, one, and a hip that's negative two, three. Right. And I have, I have found out where the REMS will match the DEXA hips pretty closely. They'll be, okay. they'll be more concordant and the DEXA spine will be off in left field. Right. But, but kind of when you apply statistics, the, the, the number that doesn't fit with all the other numbers, you're gonna throw it away. Statistically, that's right. gonna be discarded. So I think that that's a quick way of looking at a report and saying, does this make sense? Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. I mean, even labs, when you, when you get laboratories you, and you have groups of labs, uh, blood work, uh, the, um, so the red, red blood count, well, you want the numbers to kind of be, all be within the same range. If there's a right. number that's out, first of all, it might be an error or it might be indicative of a disease process. So, right, right, so, right. so if you're gonna call something normal or accurate, you want, the, you want things to be grouping together. And if they group together, now that, that, that's, the decision of, that's the definition of precision, is, is, is the numbers being tighter but when you have a machine, a scientific machine, the precision and the accuracy go together. So that, that's how I look at it. And that's also how I eval evaluate DEXAs. There, there's, a, there's a facility in Raleigh, not too far from here, that does really good DEXAs. And mm -hmm. I say that because the numbers are concordant. Their spine and hips are not way off. And a lot right. of times they will match the T-scores of DEXA and REMS will be close. So for me, when I get a DEXA from that facility, I, I like it. I usually very often, or do I have anything negative to say about it? Because it's it's well it's well done. Well, the the norm for what I see, looking at hundreds of DEXAs, is that the the spine is lower than the hip, in most yeah. all cases. Yeah. The and ISCB sometimes... says it's one standard deviation. If it's within one standard deviation, it's acceptable. If it's one point one standard deviations difference or or higher, you okay. have an invalid study, according That's to the ISCB threat guidelines. Interesting. And apparently this person is asking, if you're in the red, let's presume she's talking about the red for fragility, okay. what is the course of action, medicine or something else? And I think you said as a physician, you felt yeah. responsible to, to yeah. suggest. That's when, I have, that's when I have discussion with medications with folks. Is if, if they're high yellow, getting close to red, because the high yellow would indicate that the majority of folks have fractured, but some have not. If you cross mm -hmm. into the red, everyone with those values has fractured. And if you haven't, you, I, I think you're just lucky. That's pretty strange. That's pretty strange. I mean, that's pretty amazing to say everyone who's been in the, in the red has fractured. That's, uh, that's very striking. I definitely, if I was in that situation, I'd take the challenge to, uh, to work with that, but that's, that's, that's quite dramatic. Um, okay. So they wanted to know the correlation between trabecular score and REMS fragility. And of course, we don't know that, but it looks like that'd be a fascinating topic to study. Um, it seems obvious how to build muscles in the legs around the hips, but how does one build muscles around the spine? And you know, that's really, that's what I've always thought. I've always thought that women have lower spines because we don't do so much upper body exercise. And so we teach people how to build the back extensor muscles. And you could certainly go to your physical therapist and do some training to build the back extensor muscles. But we also then need to think about the quality of the DEXA if it says that there's a dramatic difference. But nonetheless, building the back extensor muscles, what else would you suggest for the back, Dr. Well, well, posture. I mean, first of all, that's that's one thing is, is if you work on your posture and not just throwing your shoulders back, but actually making your making sure your spine is straight. 
And every so often when, when folks come in, I show them a simple thing to first see if they, if they have kyphosis, if they actually have uh, a fixed yeah. curvature of the spine. I just have them stay stiff against the wall. Because if you right. can touch the back of your head, the back of your shoulders, and the top of your backside against the wall, all three points of contact at the same time, you do not have kyphosis. You might just have poor posture. Whereas if you're kyphotic, you can only touch the back of your head or your shoulders or your shoulders and the top of your backside, and that's it. You know, and that's an interesting exercise. Just good posture is an interesting exercise to stand on that wall and be able to lift your arms right up to the, you know, pushing it. The posture exercise is a, a simple thing to do. Talk to your physical therapist or actually look on the internet. That's a great way to build bone strength. And then the weight practices, the weight loading with, with the, of the back extensor muscles. We like the weighted vest. That's kind of a, a very nice, especially if you like to walk, it's a very nice thing to do. I know someone who had a REMS technology score in the green on this. And yeah, let's see. Okay, that's hard to understand. I have five non-traumatic compression fractures in my spine. My DEXA was minus 4.1 and REMS was... Now this again, um, uh, and Nick, Nick Britton said my spine was strong. Uh, this is a person that has written, we don't know who it is. I don't know if you know this Nick Britton. If it's Dr. Nick Birch, he's a he's an orthopedic surgeon in England who is now the um, he's the yeah. predominant user of REMS in England. Yes, 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 yes. This a person said that Nick Birch said my spine was strong, um, and yet uh, was strong. Then and yet she sustained a fracture. Then that's what she's saying. She sustained a fracture. So that's another one of those cases that it would be very. Interesting to see what, and, and, and that this might, I mean, nothing is a hundred percent. And if these folks would like to reach out to me or, or Dr. Birch, I mean, Dr. Birch and I are now beginning to collaborate. And also Dr. Zambito, we're all beginning to collaborate together. We're, 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 we have Zoom meetings every couple of months and we're going to start, we want to talk about these kind of cases. So if well, this would be very good then. It, that's a, that's a very generous suggestion because she, this apparently is a person in Britain who, has dealt with Nick Birch. So that'd be a perfect idea. Let's dig in deep. Let's find out what's going on. Let's ask the scientists to, and if you contact Dr. Bush um, at the Central Carolina. Ortho.com. Ortho, 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 Central, Central Carolina Ortho.com. Ortho um, and I, I, if you have it, I'm happy if you want to post it or, or the Facebook page, it's um, the Echo Light REMS discussion group. If they want to just say hi, hi, hi to me and, and more privately, and, and then we basically, I can provide them my information so they can con contact me directly. That's another way. Is... So, so the link is the Echolite REMS discussion group. Uh, on Facebook, yes. On Facebook. Well, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Let's the, the, this, the, this individual who, who is willing to give the details about this, uh, this, about this fracture history had a lot of fractures before this test too. And so let's, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's, why don't you dig a little deeper, get in touch with Dr. Bush and let's see what, if, if Dr. Bush and Dr. Birch can get together and figure this out. Excellent. Yeah. So we have the Facebook that's would be really fun. And for everyone who's interested in building strong bones, I'm going to kind of draw this together because we're getting a little late here, but we at the Center for Better Bones are really delighted and appreciate Dr. Bush taking his time to come be with us and, and also to step out of the familiar world of surgery and actually work with building bone strength with, with people throughout the country. We certainly wish you luck with uh, your traveling uh, your traveling capacity to measure these bone densities. We look forward to, we, I'll be meeting with you actually in, in Massachusetts when you come to the Better Bone Solution course. And uh, those of you that have not really dug very deep in looking to how you can master your bone health future, how you can develop a complete program for building bone strength, we suggest you look at the Better Bone Solution. It's gonna be May 18th to the 21st at Kerpalo, a beautiful meditation center. Uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Bush will be there doing some testing off off site, but in a near location. I think he's pretty much booked up, but you can you can get a hold of him on Facebook if you're going to be up there and want to try to be tested. And 
it's our wish that everyone take charge, look into how they can build bone health because everything you do for bone health is going to improve your overall health and your overall longevity. So with that being said, Dr. Bush, I really thank you again. You're terrifically busy and I appreciate you taking all this time. We look forward to updates of how this is all coming along, how your project to implement this new way of testing bone strength, how this is coming along here in the United States and the new research. We refer people to some of the new articles and you can find those, I'm sure, on Dr. Bush's Facebook site. Uh, it's been great. Thank you very much for spending all this time with us. Dr. Brown, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Okie doke. And everyone, have a great osteoporosis month. Remember, it's Bone Strength Month. Every, every few days, we're going to give you new tips on how to build bone strength. And I look forward to talking to each of you soon. Be well. Have a great evening. Thanks again, Dr. Bush. Thank you.